Albert Camus, an author, a scholar, an atheist, wrote a little bitty book years ago called The Fall, small book. Camus tells about a lawyer uh, from Paris, very fine, very moral, very ethical, very intelligent, did a lot of work for a lot of people pro bono, well respected, but one night he was walking in darkness along a path and he went over a bridge over the river of Seine and as he walked over the bridge, he saw a woman there leaning over the side and he just knew she was disturbed and he walked on by in the darkness and when he got just a short distance away, he heard a scream and a splash. He knew what had happened. Camus says he had to make a decision whether to go back and jump in the scene and try to save her or to run and get help that people would come and maybe get her out or he could just in the darkness, nobody's around, just walk away. He decided to just walk away. But he could not get out of his mind the scream and the splash. And he rationalized, he said, well, if I had jumped into Seine to save her, it's dark and I may have drowned myself. He said, if I'd gone to get help, could somebody come and get her out of the river? He said, I'm a lawyer. I know how the courts operated. I would have been involved in maybe some kind of plan of hurting her or I was a part of her jumping over. And he said, I knew that didn't work. And he said, the wisest thing to do was to walk away. But years went by, he couldn't forget it. He said, you know, I thought of myself as respectable and, and honorable and okay. And I did a lot of things for a lot of people. But he said, suddenly I saw myself as I really happened to be. He said, I saw that I'd never done anything good or noble or fine or given anything that people didn't know about it. And he said, I discovered that who I really am is who I am in the dark when nobody else is around. And ladies and gentlemen, that's who you are. That's who I am where our mind goes, where our thoughts go in the dark when nobody else is around. And he said, I saw myself with my mask off. And he said, I didn't like that which I saw. Years later, Camus says, he was walking on another path and went over another bridge. And he said, all of this came to his mind and he felt so guilty and so ashamed that his life was phony in every way you could define it, though everybody would say, he's a good man. And he said, I began to think, you know, I'm better than, and he called the name of a friend, I'm better than he is. Then he called the name of somebody else, he said, I'm a lot better than he is. Then he said, I thought of a woman, he said, boy, I'm sure better than she is. And he said, he went through all the people that he knew, he decided that he was way above average. He was better than almost all of them. And he said the minute he thought about that, he heard sinister laughter. He said, I looked around and nobody was there. And Camus said, then he realized there was something going on in his life that he could not explain. Even an atheist like Camus saw that in a life there is a battle going on between good and evil that's hard to understand. So we back up and we ask the question about evil. We say, I know we're evil. It showed up in the Garden of Eden, correct? But where did evil come from? 
There's all kind of theories, all kind of thesis that you can find. But it seems that theologians have not dogmatically, but found sort of a place for evil to come in the world. In Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then in Genesis 2, it says, the earth was void, it was chaotic, it was dark. And theologians said, that doesn't sound like anything God would create. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and then just one verse later, there's chaos in the cosmos, it's dark. And therefore, they say there must be a gap there. There's a gap there. There's a gap there. And looking for that gap, you can find it, I think, in Isaiah chapter 14. You can find it, I think, in Daniel. You can find it in Revelation. You can find other places in the Bible. What happened is we discover there's a war going on. There's a war in the heavenlies, and there's a war on this earth. There's a war that we can't see there and a war that we can't see here. And in that war, there's a battle between good and evil. There's a battle between God and the sinfulness that we see in our world and our society expressed internally by the mass that was taken off when that lawyer saw himself as he really was. The gap, what is that gap? We know that God created everything that is in existence, and we know that he created angels. He created angels to serve, angels to be messengers, and he had evidently in his creation, according to scriptural truth, there was one angel he put in a particular prestigious position. He's called the shining one, and somehow in the freedom that God gives to everything he created that has life, Free choice, that angel as he was receiving the worship of people and the worship of angels, somehow that angel wanted the worship for himself. And then he wanted to ascend, the Bible tells us, to take the place of God, pride, ego. And therefore in his path to ascension, other angels, about a third of the angelic host, fell with this shining one, and they fell all around and made their habitation on the earth and its cosmos and this environment, and that is the fall of the angels, and that is where evil came into being, right there in the gap, Genesis 1, Genesis 2. And therefore, we get to Genesis 3, and we see the snake. By the way, many people think that's the wrong name for the devil, and I think it is. The snake, we, we're, we're repulsed, but a better translation of Hebrew would be the shining one. The shining one. The shining one. And the devil and all of his emissaries are all around us in the world today, fighting all kind of battles and skirmishing, trying to corrupt and destroy you and me as we are created in the image of God. Destroy everything that is of God. You say, now wait a minute, this is the 21st century. You're gonna tell me that evil is not just an adjective? There's an evil person, there's an evil act, there, there's an evil event. You mean you're going to tell me that evil is a noun, a person? Do you mean you're going to tell me that there's a devil that's dressed up in a red suit and a pitchfork and has horns? No, but I'm going to tell you the devil is an adjective and is a noun, and all of his league of armies are seeking to bring down and destroy the world in which we live, especially destroy those who call the name of Jesus Christ. C.S. Lewis said it correctly. He said, there's two problems with the devil. Some people think the devil is a myth, the devil's not real, and, 
and that's the liberals. Oh, man, that's, that's old wives' tale. That's Middle Eastern mysticism. That's silly. Other people think the devil's under every bush. There's a demon everywhere you go. And Lewis says that's exactly what Satan wants us to think, that he is a myth or that he is everywhere. Understand the devil does not have the characteristics of God. God is omnipotent, all-powerful. The devil is not. God is omniscient, all-knowing. The devil is not. God is omnipresent. The devil is not. But yet the devil does have these supernatural powers as a fallen angel and all of his emissaries and demons and whatever you call them in this world are active. So we have to understand that we are in a war and the war is real and let's look at our opponents. What are we fighting against? The Bible tells us. The world the flesh, and the devil. And personally, hopefully, the devil doesn't fool with many of us because the world and flesh brings us down, correct? So we talk about the world, caught up in the world culture, the world environment, that which gives the applause of the world, that which gives success in the world. We see this is the same temptation, the same strategy that Satan used with Eve. The evil force is still used with all of us. Have you noticed it? And there was the apple. She said, man, it's beautiful. Read it. She said, you know, it, it, it's, it would taste, it would satisfy hunger. And beside that, it'll make me wise. I'll be able to run my own life and God won't have to run my life. I can have my own kind of life. Same temptation comes to us. Oh, yeah. It's beautiful, the world. Oh, it's beautiful. Oh, it, it, it tastes good. It satisfies basic drives in our life. And look, I'll run my own life. I'll be free. I can do what I want to do, say what I want to say, go where I want to say, live the way I want to live. And that's what the devil calls freedom. And that's what it ends up in slavery and bondage, that kind of phony false freedom. So, we realize we're in a war. We see who our enemy is. It is frightening. It is staggering. It is real. It is present. So we have to prepare for battle, do we not? We have to prepare for this battle. The book of Ephesians. Paul's talking to the church at Ephesus. He's saying, you come to Christ. You have the body of Christ. You fellowship, you serve, you work. But he says, also, if you're going to be successful, in other words, if we're going to have an abundant life, we better understand how to live this life as God in Christ planned for us to live this life. And then, ladies and gentlemen, he tells us how to win the battle with the devil who is the shining one, who is the beautiful one, who is the deceiving one, who tells good things and half-truths. He is so skilled. He's so talented. And here he tells us the strategy of Satan, Ephesians chapter number 6. Look what he says in the latter part of verse 11. He said, against the schemes of the devil for our struggle, there's the battle, verse 12, is not against flesh and blood. He's saying, we struggle with flesh and blood and evil, do we not? He said, that's not our only opponent. But against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. In other words, Paul is telling us there is a real battle going on for the heart, the soul, the mind, the life of each and every one of us. Jeremiah, the heart is wicked, it's deceptive. Who can know it? Who can understand it? And he's saying this is the battle, and we understand something of the strategy of Satan. He doesn't say, hey, let's go down and rob the bank. He didn't start there. He starts with padding your income tax. You know, 
overcharging, exploiting. He starts with the little bitty things. The rats get through the smallest little places, just the smallest little places. And suddenly we wake up and we say, who is that person I'm now looking at in the mirror? What happened to me? Did it happen suddenly or gradually? And so we see the strategy and we see what we ought to do about it. Look at the verses there. Verse 10. He said, finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Now, boy, I got to be strong. I got to fight the battle. He said, no, be strong in the strength of his might. What is the might of Jesus? We don't fight with our own strength, our own determination, our own ability. I'm going to defeat the devil. Man, I'm going to cast out the devil. No, we fight the devil with the strength of the might of Jesus. What kind of might did Jesus have? What was the, the power of Jesus? The devil said, I'm going to go up on top and I'm going to rule like God. God said, no, I'm going to go down to the bottom. And God became a man. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being the form of God, made him himself no reputation, took unto him the form of a servant, was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Where was Jesus demonstrating his power better than any other place that was on the cross? The cross of Jesus Christ. Jesus on that cross took all of our garbage on him. You remember the name that Jesus gave the devil? Beelzebub. You know what that name means? Lord of the garbage, the fly. So it was on the cross that Jesus took all of our trash and all of our garbage, and he died. Shameful, painful, embarrassing, death. You see, we use the might of the cross. And therefore, when you're dealing with the devil, you're dealing with evil forces, you just lift up Jesus, lift up the cross, and I'll tell you, he'll run from you, as the book of James tells us. Because the cross looked like God had lost, but God in Christ had won a great victory. And by the way, what happened to the weeks of the cross? There was Easter. You can't have the power of Easter unless, first of all, there's a death. Death is the beginning, the introduction to life. We die. Anyone who would come out to me, said, Jesus, take up your cross and follow me. We have to die to self in order to have the resurrection power of God. And when we have that power, we even overwhelm and defeat Satan by the power that's been given us, the victory that has already happened on Calvary's tree. Now, now, we see what we have. We be strong in his might, not in our might. Then he gives us his resurrection power. What else are we to do? We're to put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against his scheme. Put on. What do we put on? We put on what we already have. I've heard people preach this passage. Get up in the morning, you put this on. Oh, no, no, no. We just put on Jesus. We already have him. The armor is already there. You take off yourself, you put on Jesus Christ, and that's the whole armor of God. And then he says, on top of that, verse 13, we take up, we put it on, and then we move out with that armor. We're confident. We're strong in Christ. The resurrection power is within us. Then we put on that armor that's putting on Jesus, taking off ourselves, and then we take it up, and then we move out, and then he tells us, a beautiful thing of what we have. He says, verse 14, stand firm, therefore having done, and he lists six things that we have to do. Six things that we already have. Be strong. Put on. Take up. Stand firm in the evil world in which we live. What enables us to stand firm? Paul knew about Roman armor. He knew how they clothed themselves. He says, 
put on the belt of truth. You see it there in your Bible? That is truth of God. That is a true view of the world. If we don't have an understanding of this world as God created it, as God wants to operate it, we can't move forward. You have to build everything on truth. That's our worldview. That's how we make decisions. That's how we discover who am I? Where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? Biblical answers to that and bingo. We've got a worldview. That's truth. If you don't have a worldview based on truth, you're going to limp and you're going to be a victim of Satan and his wiles for the rest of your life. You put on the belt of truth. Then you put on the breastplate of righteousness. What is that? That's putting on Jesus Christ. What does that breastplate do? It protects your heart. It protects your emotions. It protects your will. Boy, putting on this armor is great, isn't it? Truth, a true worldview, a breastplate for Texas, and you put on your shoes of peace, the gospel of peace. In other words, where you walk, you bring peace. You bring the power of God. You bring humility. You bring understanding. You bring all that you and I are equipped with. We walk in the gospel of peace. We're putting on the armor. This is the armor. And then what do we do? We, we pick up the the shield, the shield is next. And the shield is something of faith that keeps all those fiery darts of evil and criticism and negativism and shame and fear. It protects us. That's, that's the faith we have that we have on, that we're secure in Christ. We have abundant assurance, assurance that we've already sung about. That is that shield of faith. They will. Then we put on a helmet of salvation. What does a helmet do? It protects our mind. That's where evil comes in. It protects our minds and our thoughts. Our heart is protected. We're walking properly. We have a shield that keeps off the dark of evil one. And there's some kind of par in that shield when the evil one sends his fiery darts. They are put out, protective. And the helmet of faith, helmet of salvation, we know I'm I'm with God, I'm with Christ, I'm secure in him, I'm his property, and God is for me, nobody can be against me. We've got on that helmet of salvation. And then the final thing, we pick up that, that sword, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and this is our offensive weapon. Jesus, when he was tempted in the wilderness, what did he do? He just quoted the scripture. The power of the word of God is there. And that is the sword that we have. Look where we are, ladies and gentlemen. We're in a world where obviously there is evil. We're in a world where obviously so many people are victims of that evil. What do we do? We have to be strong in the strength of his might. We get that from the cross. We have to be strong. What else do we do? We have to take up. And we have to put on this whole armor. We've named all the parts of it. And therefore, when we come to Christ, understand we receive Christ, we become W-H-O-L-E. We become whole people, whole people. But the evil one is always looking for a, a weak spot, a hole. And so therefore, if we are to be successful, we have to keep on asking the Holy Spirit to show up in my life and your life, where are there any holes there? Any holes in your life? That's where Slewfoot wants to get in. You're, you're off just one thing. Oh, Lord, I'm just one degree off. That's where evil wants to invade. So we are to march in this world for the Lord Jesus Christ with confidence and guess what can happen to us? Would everyone bow your head for a moment and just close your hands like this? Would you pray these words after me? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth 
as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses and we forgive those who trespass against us. And deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.